morning. How's everybody doing this morning? Welcome to FBC. Welcome to the start of a new year. How's everybody's resolutions going? Good. Have we already given up on them? Did we make any? Do we just skip it all together? Roger starts his diet tomorrow, he just said. <laughs> so does everybody. Yes. <laughs> so, um, well, welcome back. Welcome to the new year. Another year here at FBC. We're starting a new sermon series today. And I think Roger is going to uh, put on our hearts uh, some new, uh, a new way of thinking about resolutions and a new way of thinking about making change in our own lives uh, today and, and throughout the rest of this year as we study the gospel of Mark. So um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to cut it there and just invite you guys to go ahead and stand. We're going to get right into it this morning with, with some songs. We're glad that you're here. Um, hope you're excited to see what God is going to do in this time. I know I am, and I know I'm grateful to be in this house with you guys this morning. So. place you are welcome in this place holy 
Heavenly Father, we are humbled to be in your house this morning to worship you. Father God, to come just as we are this morning in this new year, Lord. And while we joke about resolutions, Lord, we use this time. The reason we think about making changes is because we feel like we have this new slate where, where 2019 has been wiped away and 2020 is just a, a blank canvas for us to look forward at. But Lord, as your children, we, have a, we are given a blank slate once for all through the shedding of blood by your son Jesus on the cross. And so we can think about resolutions and that's all fine and, and good, but Lord, if we don't live with the knowledge of the grace that you've given us, our resolutions don't much matter. So Lord, I pray for every Christian in this room this morning um, that doesn't live out uh, with the fullness of grace that they have accepted when they've surrendered their life to Christ, um, that they can, that we can see more clearly the love that you have for us. And Lord, I pray for anybody in here this morning that uh, doesn't call themselves a Christian, uh, just to know the total love and grace that you provide. Let them know that it's okay, that they're here, and we're happy about that. Uh, but Lord, let them know the truly transforming, uh, more than a lifestyle, more than anything, this relationship with you can truly, truly be about. Lord, for this opportunity and this moment this morning, just to worship you and just to be together and just to be reminded of the blank slate you gave us once for all through the death and resurrection of your son on the cross. I hear the Savior say, thy strength indeed is small. Child of weakness, watch and pray. Find in me thine only hope. Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain. He washed it white as snow.
praise the one who paid my debt and raised his life up from the dead. Oh, praise the one who paid my debt and raised his life up from the dead. Oh, praise the one who paid my debt and raised his life up from the dead. Oh, Good morning. Just a couple of announcements this morning. I hope that you all got a bulletin when you walked in, and it's full of information that you need to know about things going on here at First Baptist Church of Maslin. First of all, in that bulletin is what we call a reach and transform sheet. It says reach on one side, transform on the other. If there's something you need to communicate to the church office, fill that out. Put it in the offering plate when the time comes so they know that. Also, this is the first Sunday of the month, so not only do we do communion on the first Sunday of the month, we also take our communion offering, and so um, anything that comes into that account through the communion offering goes into what we call the 900 account, and that helps the church to be able to help uh, families or individuals during extreme times of need when they may have lo had a job loss or something else going on, and uh, we can only help as we've got money in the 900 account. It's We are busy, folks. We are busy here at First Baptist Church of Maslin. We've got lots of things going on. That's why I always encourage people to look at your bulletin, to look at it before you take your nap this afternoon. Don't do it during Roger's message, just before your nap this afternoon. And uh, make sure that you've got things marked on the calendar that you want to attend, and you don't miss anything that you want to be a part of. In January, we've got a couple of... Um, spiritual gift classes coming up and if you've been thinking if you've never been become a member at first baptist and you'd like to know more there are going to be two membership classes in the month of january also and then there are lots of events coming up in february too we've got um, our next financial peace class starting in february there's a marriage retreat coming up in february uh, there's lots of information too you know maybe you're at a place in your life where you need to be ministered to and so there's information about what you can be involved in to get ministered to. But maybe you're in a place where you're looking like, you know, I want to put my hands and feet to work at First Baptist. And so there are opportunities to minister in the bulletin also. And I know that we are always looking for people in the tech booth to run the computer in both the early service and this service. And there's not, I don't think there's a ministry in the church where we couldn't use some help. So if you're looking to be involved at First Baptist Church, let us know, and we, we will find the place that you need to be. Um, I also just want to mention, too, that in the, the coat room back there, there is, is a kind of our, what we call our mailboxes, and it's by um, first letter of your last name, but lots of you have cards back there from, from Christmas and the holidays, so check that so you don't miss all the cards that, that people sent for you. Um, I'm an H, so I know Kathy Harper has a ton of cards back there. <laughs> so, so if you see Kathy, tell her to get her cards. I didn't check the other initials, but I know Kathy Harper has a lot of cards. And uh, we just welcome you today. It's just good to be in the house of God. Good to have the freedom to be in, in the house of God. 
You know, I'm always impressed when, when I'm here um, for a portion of, of worship in this service, that how things, um, God just uses the, the music from the praise team. And I don't know about all of you, because sometimes we sing and we just sing the words, but as we were singing this morning, both of those songs had something that, that hit me. And the second one is that Jesus paid it all, and, and it says, um, I had, I was, uh, my sins were crimson, but, God, but Christ paid it all and made me white as snow. Isn't that a powerful thought? Because, you know, you don't know my secrets. You don't know my sins. And I'm not going to tell you. Not even if you ask afterwards. And I don't know yours. And I don't need to know yours because God knows. God knows each one of us. God knows our sins. God knows our needs. God knows the areas of healing that we need. And he knows that they, they might be a bright crimson, a middle crimson, or a very dark crimson. I don't know. It doesn't matter. Whatever color the sins are that we bring in here, we don't have to leave with those because Christ can make us white as snow. And then the first song that we sang said, come and fill us up. Come and fill us up. What area of your life do you need a filling in today? Maybe you have some health issues. Maybe you're having financial issues. Maybe you're having relational issues. You know, whatever it is, the answer is here. You're not here by happenstance. You're here, and you don't have to leave the same way that you came in. Whatever you, your need is today, God is here to meet that need and, and to speak to you and to fill your heart and your soul and send you out in a new way for this new year. So keep that in mind. Let's bow our heads. Dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you today. We thank you for allowing us freely to be in your sanctuary. We didn't have to hide from the police, Lord, to come in these doors. We didn't have to go through back alleyways, Lord. We are open to be here worshiping in your house. And Lord God, we're so thankful that you are here to greet us and that you know each one of us intimately, Lord. And you know what we need today, and you have the answers that we seek. May we open our minds and our hearts and our souls, Lord God, to receive your healing, your leading, your strength, your direction. May we not close ourselves off in any way today, Lord God, to what you want us to have, what you want to give to us, and what you want to do through us. Lord, I ask for each person in this sanctuary, Lord, to just hear from you in the way that they need to and that they would leave differently than they came in. God, I pray that you would bless the rest of this service and that you would just have your way in everything that happens. In Christ's holy, holy name we pray. Amen. Come to earth to bring us joy, and I just want to sing this song to you. It goes like this, the fourth, the fifth, the minor fall, the major lit, with every breath I'm singing, hallelujah, hallelujah. Couple came to Bethlehem expecting child. They searched the inn to find a place for you were coming soon. But there was no room for them to stay. So in a major field with hay, God's only son was born. Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. 
shepherds left their flocks by night to see this baby wrapped in light. A host of angels led them all to you. And it was just as the angels said, you'll find him in a major bed. Not bad for a sixth grader, huh? Is that not amazing? Too many mics. Thank you, Hattie. We are starting a brand new sermon series. This one's going to last about 18 months. I'm not kidding. (laughs) We broke it down into a bunch, but we're actually going to walk through the whole gospel of Mark. uh, and should be done sometime by the next decade. So uh, I want to encourage you just to kind of read the gospel of Mark and read it as we go along and and just kind of digest it as we dig into it. It's a powerful gospel. It's the first gospel. It's the oldest gospel. It is the gospel which bases everything that Matthew and Luke, as well as John, utilize to teach us about who Jesus is. So it is going to be a a great sermon series, and I'm excited about it because anytime you're preaching about Jesus, well, it's just a good thing. Yeah. Yeah. So did you have a good new year? Everybody watch the ball come down? Y'all don't do that anymore? It's one of the few hedonistic activities I participate in. I watch the ball come down. It's fascinating. You know, the PR in place for them to make you feel like, woohoo, it's a new year. And now they're saying, woohoo, it's a new decade. And isn't life grand and wonderful? right? And it it is unbelievable. And some of that, you know, we all have. We all have hope for the future, uh, horizon look that maybe down the road there'll be a better world, we'll be a better nation, and a better community, and we even hope we might be better ourselves. We set resolutions that most of us probably haven't fulfilled by now. And uh, we walk through that time, and, and it's good to celebrate. And now it's January 5th. Reality has set in, hasn't it? I know it did for me yesterday. My wife and I had our 34th anniversary. You know where we spent it? On the couch. She was on the couch. I was in bed. And there was no romance at all. We were both sicker than a dog. (laughs) What a way to spend 34 years together. We looked on the couch and said, happy anniversary, honey. (laughs) But we survived it. But reality has set in, and we realize, yes, the world has fallen. Ohio State's no longer in the playoffs, hasn't it? It's fallen. In all seriousness, though, when you do look around us, in our own culture, we've got two political parties in charge of our government that have yet to figure out how to work with one another and are more focused on each other than the best interests of the governing people that they govern. Tensions are escalated right now between the United States and Iran. Looks all kind of scary, doesn't it? And even though we're living in one of the best economies that the world has ever seen, we're always ready and waiting for the shoe to fall off, aren't we? That somehow that economy will turn around and just go and lay a big egg. 
I don't know about you, but if I open up my newspaper, yes, I still read a newspaper, but I also read my Google feed along with it so I can feel like I halfway am in touch with the world. Uh, It's easy to see how this world's crazy. Absolutely nuts. And I don't know about you, but I wonder, will it ever change? Will it ever change? It seems like there is always a struggle, a struggle between the good and the bad, a struggle between uh, the godly and the evil one, a struggle between the powerful and wealthy versus the weak and the poor. And, And it's hard, and you wonder, will it ever, ever change? And when will the world finally begin to reflect what God actually created it to be? And when will we honor God the way we are called to? Will we love our neighbor? Will we love ourselves the way God intended? I don't know about you, but it's a struggle sometimes when we see all that. And the fact is, this has really been an age-old issue for not just the world, but the cosmos. Think about it. In the beginning... God created the angels and other heavenly beings. And they lived according to God's rule and God's presence. And we call that the the kingdom of heaven. But then pride and rebellion sits in. And a celestial force by the name of Lucifer and his allies revolt against God and is banished and exiled from God's presence and becomes the prince of this world. The prince of darkness, Satan, devil, Beelzebub, the evil one, the thief who wants to strike and steal life from the throne of God. This history of rebellion started way back before the world was even created. And as Frank Bioa states, when you leave God's presence, you leave God's rule. You see, That wasn't the only place rebellion took place. Think about creation for a moment in Genesis. God creates the crowning glory of creation. You know what that crowning glory is? It's you and I. It's humanity. And when the pinnacle creation is there, they're enjoying enjoying the Garden of Eden. They walk in relationship with God. They live out life in God's purpose, relationship, and love. They are the beachhead from which humanity is to rule the earth with God's authority. But we know how that story goes, don't we? We run and we rebel. And God's got to work another way. So Adam and Eve are exiled from the Garden of Eden. Humanity continues to spiral further out of control to the point that God chooses to just wipe the whole thing out except for one holy man by the name of Noah and his family. And all of a sudden, that family saved and the rest of the world threw his ship. And then what happens? The world rebels again. And another fall. That doesn't work. And then God says, well, let's work through Abraham. And he relaunches his original intention and gives Abraham descendants of the nation of Israel, and they become involved in what's called the land of Canaan. Canaan was to be the new Eden, a place where God could rule through human beings and a place where God's kingdom could touch earth and begin to impress and expand and have incredible impact on the people around him. The kingdom of heaven, God was to show us The world that looks like what it's like when a nation is in charge by God. But we know how that turned out, don't we? You hearing a theme? Regrettably, Israel follows the way of the first angels, the first human beings, and they're exiled from Canaan. You see the pattern? Yeah. And instead of a nation being led by God, now... What they wanted to become was become a political entity. And so the kings are put in place. And the kings of Israel lead the nation not towards God, but away from God. And God ends up punishing them by destroying the northern kingdom, and then a little bit later, the southern kingdom, and Israel is dispersed all along the Mediterranean. I hate to say this, but I think I see a pattern. You see, God moves to bring humanity closer and closer and closer to God, and yet humanity rebels, wants their own power, their own say, 
their own way, even though it's destructive. I think that's why most of us have concluded, no matter how many new years we live through, no matter what political party we put into office, the evil one still dominates this world. I think everyone understands this, no matter what their religious orientation is. Why do you think Star Wars is an $11 billion industry? Have you thought about that? 11 billion big ones. 10 movies and more to come. Why? Because Lucas has struck a chord within humanity. We know there's a battle going on some way, somehow. We know there's a battle in life between good and evil, between the dark side and the light side, between God's side and Satan's side. Whether we have the biblical orientation or the biblical understanding for it or not, it's there. You can see the conflict. The Israelites even understood this. You see, you and I long for a world that is destined for God's presence that would honor God, honor others, and honor oneself. And the nation of Israel looked forward to a time when God would restore God's rule and God's exercise in the world and God's claim on the land and create a new beachhead for God to invade this darkness that has been created by the evil one and restore God's power and dominion. The prophets of the Old Testament would point to it. They would point to a suffering servant who would restore the people to God's relationship and liberate the people. And God would create a new covenant that would put God's spirit inside God's people. And God would restore God's image within humanity. The Davidic kingdom was promised to David, saying it would never end. And yet the nation of Israel didn't exist anymore. And yet there's a promise that something would happen. And then the prophet tells us, the eyes of the blind will be open. The ears of the deaf will be unstopped. The lame will leap. The tongues of the mute will sing. And when will this happen? When? Well, Matthew and Luke would describe it happening through the birth narratives of Jesus. You know, that stuff about Mary and Elizabeth and Anna. You know, those stories about Joseph, Zechariah, and and Simeon. We would see Matthew communicate it further, even through the story of the wise men and Herod. And of course, we can't leave out the shepherds. God's entering the world as a baby. But... If you look at it from Mark's gospel, all those wonderful stories aren't there. You know how Mark chooses to tell us about this new era where God enters into humanity? He chooses to describe it through a famous prophecy that everyone would know. Have you ever been to a a place or a party where someone plays a song and everybody starts singing it? You know what I mean? Come listen to a story about a man named Poor Mountaineer who... Well, you basically understand it. And and the understanding is this. Even though they wouldn't have known about Jed or the minnow who went on a three-hour tour and was stuck on an island for the rest of their lives, they would know this word. Because this word was implanted upon their hearts. And they would hear it and know it and be able to say it. So when Mark writes, look, I am sending a messenger ahead of you who will prepare the way, the voice of the one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his way straight, everybody would know that. It was like it was written on the back of their hands and their head everywhere. They could just quote it and not worry about even memorizing it because it would just come out of them. And then what happens is is once Mark quotes this world-famous text for his people, he then goes on to tell us how it's fulfilled. And he shares then in verses 4 these words, the fulfillment of the prophecy. John the baptizer appeared in the wilderness proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And the people from the whole Judean countryside and all the people from Jerusalem were going out to him and were baptized by him in the river Jordan confessing sins. 
What a scene. And then it goes on to say in verse 6, now John was clothed with camel's hair. Don't you see that as a beautiful fashion? Camel's hair. Yeah? Yeah. Leather belt around his waist. He ate locusts and wild honey. Like that diet? Try that one for the new year. And he proclaimed, the one who is more powerful than I is coming after me. I am not worthy to stoop down and untie the thongs on his sandals. And I baptize you with water. But he is going to baptize you with the Holy Spirit. Now, what Mark is trying to tell us is he's trying to show us, look, here's this famous prophecy, and now, bam, it is fulfilled to the person of John. And John's message to us is, is, hey, there is one coming who is going to turn the world upside down. And John says here in Mark that God will place the Spirit of God in you. Now, what's interesting to me is if you were to study the totality of John's message in his story of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John in the Gospels, you would understand his message is incredibly radical. And it's beyond radical. It actually is very dramatic. And we miss some of that because of the cultural changes in the world today. For example, one of the ways that it was radical is what John was wearing. He was wearing camel's hair, which you need to understand, that was ceremonially unclean. You were never supposed to wear that stuff. It makes you unclean. The Jew would have never allowed that to happen. He was defying religious tradition. He ate wonderful things like locusts and honey. Who wants to go right out and make that their diet? No? No. Which shows us what? He broke from materialism, greed, and worldly pleasure. He lived in a wilderness, which meant he had no attachments to the world around him. John was a walking insurgent. He was outrageous. He was scandalous. He was disruptive. He pulled out of the entire world system. Now, it's hard for us to understand that context in today. So let me share with you, at the chance of making you mad, uh, a, a contemporary understanding to us. For example, if John was walking around today, he'd go, United States of America or name any nation that you're a part of, you're not being ruled by God. You belong to the USA. You've given that country your allegiance, not God. Oh, he doesn't stop there. Organized religion, it's not being ruled by God. They're organized for their survival, not the kingdom of God ministry. And their political systems, well, let's just talk about that for a moment, as if we need a vivid illustration. Your politics, your political people are more interested in their power than they are being justice people for the masses. Your educational systems, are they ruled by God? Are you kidding me? We teach science, biology, art, Literary fields as if there's no God involved in any of that. And your entertainment systems, do we need to really talk about Hollywood? It's hedonistic. They push their own ungodly agenda. And your healthcare system. Here we are living in the United States who has probably the best healthcare system in the world, but yet it's ruled by the almighty dollar instead of giving out God's healing. Hmm. And your economic system? Let's just talk about that for a while. It's not ruled by God, or else it wouldn't be just about the shareholder, but the communities which the businesses are in, the employees which work in the business, and even further, the people who are doing business with those folks. It's not about the bottom line. It is about being a benefit to humanity. And here's what's interesting to me, is after John literally makes these contrasts, this is what he comes out to say. In Matthew chapter 3, verse 10, he says, Look it, the axe is lying at the root 
of the tree. Every tree, therefore, that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into fire. Yeah! Isn't that good news? Do you see what John is saying? He's saying God's kingdom does not work by the systems around us necessarily. And if those systems are corrupt, guess what we ought to do to them? Make some kindling. John's message is radical. And it's radical even further regarding the understanding of how God's realm and reign comes into this world. John says, I got good news for you, though. God is about to inaugurate a whole new era. God is going to inaugurate a whole new relationship with God. God is about to create a kingdom that transfers over geographical and political boundaries. God is going to make children out of people who are not even related to one another be family. God is saying, look, it, we're going to create circumstances and situations where my good news is going to come in and radically transform the people in this world who choose to be part of God's world, no matter what this world may be. It is not part of the religious system, the political system, the educational or entertainment system. It's not a part of the economic system. What it is a part is the kingdom of God within you. And this new nation, this new group of people, will come from the heavenly realm and soon touch the earth. And he says it's going to have a king. And you know who that king is? It's Jesus. And once that group of people are formed, once that nation comes, it will never, ever end. It's going to outlast every other kingdom, every other organization. And so... The gospel writer Mark says it this way in the very first verse. This is the beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. He is going to turn the world upside down. You see, this message and this good news about Jesus was a subversive message that people believed, lived out, and heralded to others. It constituted a nonviolent re revolution, a quiet revolt against the present order. It does not include laser swords or armies destroying people and everyone. It does not include destruction, but it includes a total transformation of humanity's character and of God's presence in their life so that God's presence can be seen in the midst of the world the way God's children live out that presence. It means if we allow Jesus to come into our lives, we become the new wine that shatters the structures around us, that blows away and apart the, new wine, the old wineskins. It means if you and I are following Jesus and we're part of his life, then we become the yeast that begins to infect all the people around us so that they too can become the folks who rise up and enjoy the blessing and the presence of God and carry on the kingdom work. It means pointing to Jesus and say, the time has come. God has entered this world. God has come into our time frame, and now his kingdom is at hand. So repent, believe in the gospel of the good news of Jesus. And as we connect, as we communicate, as we commune with people, we let them know about this spirit that is alive in us. And we share with them what it's about. And then God's movement moves from person to person to person, creating a rabble rouser for heaven that takes on this world in its evil dimension. You see, for me, as I've been studying this and looking at it over the last six months, this insurgence of God in our world through Jesus is the power of the Holy Spirit 
that becomes the groundswell of grace in us, salvation in us, life in us, so that the message, the love, and the work of Jesus can be proclaimed to allow the world to see God's glory in and through us. It allows the eternal kingdom of God to influence the realm of this world. Therefore, we are part of a never-ending kingdom. It is ultimately the insurance insurgents of heaven, the kingdom of God upon this world, so that God's love comes out and touches it and transforms it. This insurgence ought to impact all of us that call ourselves followers of Jesus. And it impacts this community. And if it doesn't, we're doing the wrong thing. You see, the insurgence of God impacts our worship. For if we don't know it impacts our worship, then worship is nothing more than a show. But if the insurgence impacts our worship, worship then should unveil the king's beauty to us so we're further transformed into the likeness of Jesus and the actions of Jesus. This insurgence of the power and the spirit of God in our lives should also impact our community that we call First Baptist Church here in the way we treat one another, in the way that we act towards one another, in the way that we love one another. It means, yes, if you get a phone call that says, my spouse is stuck on the bedroom floor, can you send someone over to help me pick her up? It means, yeah, I go. This insurgence impacts the world by also the way we treat and love other people. Especially inside of the church. You see, inside of the church, it's how we minister. Inside of the church, it allows a, a, a young sixth grade woman to come up, share her spiritual gift. Who could not see the spirit come out of her when she sang her hallelujah, right? That's what the church is about. That's when you sense the insurgence of a movement of the spirit of God, even amongst 11-year-olds. Or are you 12? How old? Still not old enough. But anyway, it lets us serve one another in love. And the insurgents also causes us to, yes, share the good news to people outside of these four walls. That somehow through Jesus, God can touch them and continue the process. That's what it's about. And over the next months and year, we're going to be seeing how this power is to work through us and in us as Jesus displays it throughout the gospel so that we too can follow Jesus. So, let me ask, do you want a really good new year? Then blow off your resolutions and focus on the life of God and eternity here on earth. Think of yourself as the forerunner to Jesus, like John. No, you know what? Forget that. We no longer need a forerunner. Why? Why do we not need a forerunner? He's already here! Thank you. You can tell you went to seminary. He's already here. We don't need a forerunner. And here's the blessing. He's within you. If you've turned your life over to him, he's within you. You see, the, this whole thing um, that we call communion is all about that. While the team's getting in place, I want to share with you a few things about what communion is. You see, originally, when they started this ceremony, it was called the Passover. And the Passover was just this. It was a celebration of God's specific contact and miraculous work within a people who were slaves. God picked this wily, ratted group of people up, pulled them out of Egypt and enslavement, 
And he says, guess what? I'm now going to be your God. This has not worked the way I wanted to in the last thousand years, so now we're going to do this differently. I'm going to pick up the, 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 the least powerful people on the world that I know of. They're slaves. We're going to pull them out of Egypt so everybody will be overwhelmed by what God has done, what I have done. And, and you know what? I'm going to bring salvation to you. So you know the story, don't you? If not, go watch the movie with Charleston Heston, and you might learn a little bit. But anyway, all these miracles take place, and they participate in a thing that gets started called Passover. And it was literally to celebrate what God has done. He rescued them. He saved them so that they could become his people. So they had taken the bread, and they said, look, this represents the bondage that we have and the brokenness of our backs as we were enslaved by a whole other nation. And this cup reminds us of the presence of God's Spirit that's in us, even though we were enslaved, but now we're released in our own nation. And the people celebrated that for thousands of years. And it was to remind them of what God had done. Well, Jesus shows up comes into this world, and Jesus transforms this ceremony into a whole other thing. And he says, look, this is not about the God who is out there. This is about a new relationship that I, as God's son, are creating for you. This bread that is broken will now represent my brokenness that I have served for you. This cup that you're taking is to be a reminder of a new covenant. And you want to know what that new promise was? That the Spirit of God would engage you personally. We would no longer need a prophet. We would no longer need a priest. We would no longer need a king. We would no longer need anybody to tell us individually what's going on in our lives and how we ought to live it. But we now would have the very Spirit of God himself within to direct us and to guide us. That's the new covenant. So the thing we participate in called communion is just that. It is to be reminded of how God has rescued us from this current life circumstance so that we could, too, be drawn unto him. It's an age-old story. And as we enjoy communion today, let us be reminded of how much God loves us, is willing to send Jesus to help us escape the darkness of this world. And even more importantly, be an agitator for glory in the midst of this world. As we take the bread and as we take the cup together, it is my hope you will be reminded of the great glory of God and his life and love and sacrifice through his son Jesus. The scripture says that they had a word of prayer before they shared these elements, and I'm going to invite Mike to share with us in a moment. But as a word of instruction, just hold on to the elements until I lead us together in taking them together. Let's pray together. Father, we come to you this morning, and we're thankful that you sent your son, Jesus. We're thankful that he died willingly, that we might come to know you, come to live for you, We know that we cannot do these things without your spirit within us. We're thankful for that too, Lord. Father, we would ask this morning as we begin this new year that uh, you would forgive us of of our sins as you promised you would and that we are able to forget those sins and move forward, to strain forward towards the goal that is set before us, the goal of moving heavenward in Christ to live as Christ intended us to live, obedient to him, loving him first and then loving others. 
Father, we thank you that this can be our new goal. In Christ's name, amen. Amen. Jesus called himself the bread of life. Take and enjoy the sustenance of God as Jesus gives it unto you. As you enjoy the cup, he also called himself the vine. Realize that by your connection to Jesus and the fruit your life bears, that you represent the life that God would want to take place in the midst of this world. As you consume this juice that represents the vine that God gives, be reminded of the goodness of God and how he passes it on to you through the grace and the mercy of Jesus' action on the cross. Take and drink. I 
bigger than disease. You are bigger than our broken hearts. You are bigger than the strife we share amongst ourselves and our family. Bigger than broken relationships. You're bigger than war. than disaster, whether it be natural or man-made, Lord, you are bigger than all of it. Help us have eyes to see the breadth and depth of who you are. 
and not just see it from afar and say, okay, you're pretty big, man, but actually live with the knowledge of who you are and let it affect our decision making. Show us how to not be content with the status quo the way John was and of course the way Jesus wasn't. Show us how to challenge that status quo with love. God, lead our way and we will follow. And that's our prayer for this year. Lead our way and we will follow. I pray that over this place right now. That you will lead our path and we will be bold enough to follow when the world, when our friends, when our family doesn't agree, we will follow your path. We will reach down and help brother and sister know that the true love you have for us is brought out in each and every one of our fellow humans. 100% of people on this earth are made in your image, God. Don't let us forget that. Lead our way and we will follow. stop working never stop you never stop working even when i don't see it you're working even when i don't feel it you're working you never stop you never stop working never stop you never stop working even when i don't see it you're working As we close this morning, um, I saw this quote uh, the other day, and I wanted to share it. It's from uh, Shane Claiborne, who's a Christian activist, who's actually kind of a radical dude. He, I think, like he, like he makes his own clothes. So, like, he's like you thinking of John the Baptist being weird. Like, it's the kind of weird we're looking for, like countercultural to the world, right? Like to see somebody and be like, Ooh, "You're doing something different, man." But anyway, this quote is, um, I think, a really good kind of point for us in, in light of this insurgence that we feel and just doing things different than the world around us. It says, peacemaking doesn't mean passivity. It is the act of interrupting injustice without mirror. The act of disarming evil without destroying the evildoer. The act of finding a third way that is neither fight nor flight, but the careful, arduous pursuit of reconciliation and justice. It is about a revolution of love that is big enough to set both the oppressed and the oppressors free. And that's what we're talking about, guys. We're, we're flipping this thing all the way upside down. So don't uh, continue to engage the world the same way, but, but start to engage it with that spirit of love and knowing uh, uh, 
who our Father really is and how he will bring eternity onto earth uh, one day and start to live that out now. So have a great week. Uh, hope to see you again next time. I could stay here all my life and never see